Yeah, so I guess I forgot about this, huh? Well, it's as good a time as ever to finish up the rest of the Prehistoric Planet episodes, so without further ado, let's get going. Prehistoric Planet is now officially fully out on Apple TV Plus for everyone to enjoy. This whole project was, according to Dr. Steve Bursati, about 10 years in the making. Precisely what that means in regard to exact start times, fundraising, and expert collecting all the way to the finished product is unknown. Surprisingly scant are references to the directors of the show, Andrew Jones and Adam Valdez. Aside from the artist doing all the hard hands-on work with the dinos and the paleontologists guiding their hands, the directors are the most important in regard to how the show is shot, how the animals are portrayed, and much more. The show is also produced by BBC Studios Natural History Unit in conjunction with Jon Favreau of Iron Man, Chef, Lion King, The Mandalorian, and Jungle Book fame as executive producer and showrunner. The visual effects were done by The Moving Picture Company with narration by David Attenborough. The soundtrack was composed by Hans Zimmer, Kara Talv, and Anz Rosman. Talv and Rosman even invented and modded new instruments for the show in order to make some truly amazing sounds to mirror the truly amazing science going into this series. And I also want to show you the fat Rex that we use for our Velociraptor theme. I don't think it is exaggerating to call Prehistoric Planet not just a successor to Walking with Dinosaurs, but a superior production aided by Hollywood money and cooperation among everyone involved. No one's expertise was thrown out by executive meddling or a director's personal preference. <coughs> It would be a crime not to shout out the animators and CGI artists that worked on this project. Something Apple and BBC apparently couldn't spare the time to do with their credits. Shashank Shakar is a texture and visual effects artist that worked on the project for one and a half years, specifically working on the Velociraptors, Coethoraptor, Therizinosaurus, Beelzebufo, Ornithomimus, and Troodonts. Another artist that went uncredited is Cameron Clough, who is a creature animator and pre-viz, post-viz artist for Marvel, HBO, and BBC. On top of that, he is a part-time animator for Prehistoric Kingdom, hence the quite lifelike movements. He worked on the Triceratops segment, as he has more expertise in the muscles, movement, and life appearance of these guys. Taurosaurus is his favorite dinosaur after all. Sanjay Singh worked on some of the main animals, like the Tarbosaurus, Cicernosaurus, and more, with the Moving Picture Company. Alan Bolkas was also with the Moving Picture Company, with Damien Guymoneau and Anthony Sieben, and supervised by Dan Zelks. Michaela Dahl, who goes by Silvery Lantern on Twitter, and Sean Lack, or Momentarily Epic on Twitter, were also animators brought on board the team. I'm confident that I'm missing some people here, as this project was a monumental effort by a monumental team. Unfortunately, there is only so much I can do to find everyone involved when the show kinda made very little effort to highlight those same people, so I apologize to those I have left out. Unfortunately, the caveat for the whole series is that it only takes place 66 million years ago. However, it takes us all over the world to show us animals that the general audience has never seen before. 
It also has to show you animals you know, but thanks to 20 plus years of new information since walking with dinosaurs, these old favorites are refurbished to show the audience how much the hard science of paleontology has changed. It also doesn't take place precisely at 66 million years. It is stated to be 66 million years for simplification, but it takes place between 72 and 66 million years, just for clarification. These are the most accurate prehistoric animals ever to be recreated in video form. Each episode covers a biome across the planet rather than a chunk of time. It was a five-night event with five episodes each coming out on each of those five nights. Recap The episode begins by showing the audience the freshwater rivers and waterfalls that carve their way through a bunch of canyons. They are inhabited by flocks of young Ashtarkid pterosaurs somewhere in Northeast Asia. The segment's main conflict is a small trio of velociraptors creeping in on the pterosaur colony. They attack and almost kill some before failing. The female of the group is able to throw a pterosaur off a cliff and tumble down the cliff chasing after it. In the end, she gets her meal. From this segment, we go to somewhere wetter. After a torrential downpour, we are treated to the return of Tyrannosaurus. Unfortunately, to those who wish to finally see a good confrontation between Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops, we meet the Tyrannosaurus of this episode after he had already killed a Triceratops and had a little nappy. The old male heads on over to a river to have a little soak and meets a female Tyrannosaurus. He does a little mating dance and woos the female. Then we get to see obscured dinosaur mating, despite the fact this is supposed to be a nature documentary. But hey, I don't blame them obscuring the bits. It remains unknown what kind of bits they used and how they used them to reproduce. Then we are whisked away to Asia again, this time to a flooded plain to meet Dinochiris. This guy eats some water weeds, plops some dung out to pollute the swamp, and rubs his back on a dead tree. Good times were had by all, and the soundtrack slapped something fierce. From Shrek the Dinochirus in his stinky swamp, we are then taken away to another swamp entirely. This southern African setting plays host to one of the longer and interesting segments of this episode, the Quetzalcoatlus nesting behaviors. A big female Quetzalcoatlus has migrated to these swamps to lay her eggs. We are treated to a wonderful time lapse of her building her nest and laying her eggs. After she does all the hard work, we get to see an interesting interaction that happens all the time in today's egg layers. Competition. Another female comes in and wrecks the eggs and nest to steal materials to make her own and to kill the competition. From there, we are off to another waterway, this time in Madagascar. Here is the segment in which we see a mother Mashikasaurus and her young exploring the banks hunting for crabs. Unfortunately, this fun is interrupted by the enormous predatory frog Bielzebufo, who attacks and swallows one of the young. Though brief, this segment is no less memorable. Once we are done with the Mashikasaurus family, we come to the last segment of the episode, the boundary between fresh and salt water. The main characters of this segment are a pod of elasmosaurs that explore inland waterways when high tide occurs. They explore the brackish waters hunting some fish and meeting the Quetzalcoatlus and a sauropod that is assumed to be Repetosaurus. The episode ends with the Plesiosaurs making their way back out to the open ocean and catching some more fish. That was fresh water. Tell me what your favorite segment is from this episode in the comment section below. Onward to the meat and potatoes, the reason you're here. Animal Accuracies or not, the point of this whole endeavor was to show what the public knows as the main characters of the late Cretaceous, dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and the marine reptiles, in as natural and accurate a light as modern science and technology could make possible. To marry the groundbreaking technology produced for and used in the film industry to bring back the long dead, with the help of cutting-edge dinosaur science. As such, every single critter should be as up-to-date as studies and fossils will allow, and any sort of soft tissue structure or behavior should be backed up with as much parsimony as possible. 
Has Prehistoric Planet succeeded in this venture? Well, in order to answer this question, we must first painstakingly approach each and every design with information from the literature, the fossil record, and from the very words of the scientists who were consulted for the project. Kirsten Formoso, Professor Steve Brusati, John Hutchinson, Robert Spicer, and Paul Valdez, Doctors Darren Nash, Mark Witten, Victoria Arbor, Alexander Farnsworth, and Scott Hartman. Pterosaurs In comes the pterosaur segment. Having had some of the world's most renowned pterosaur experts on the consultant team, like Drs. Mark Witten and Darren Nash, the pterosaur anatomy is perfectly reconstructed here to what is known of them. Many have questioned why the pterosaurs in this series fold their wings up so tightly that the ends look like spiny fingers. This question arises from a paleoart meme in which the end of the pterosaur wing is reconstructed as lobe-like or spoon-shaped. This was touted, even by me, as the accurate way to reconstruct the wingtip after the new dino renaissance of the 2010s as a result of the All Yesterday's Book and Movement. This meme is just that, a meme, and not really based on any data collected from the bones. The fact is that pterosaurs could adjust their wings better than bats can today. The arm bones were invaded by huge air sacs which, in conjunction with the huge muscles, would have made the wings themselves rather thick. On top of that, the wings were made up of different layers of tissues. One of those layers contained a special type of fiber, actinofibrils, that cross-hatched the other wing tissues and themselves. They allowed the animal to relax or tense the wing as desired. The wing itself was kept in an outswept angle when flying, almost a Superman pose. All of this is shown in the prehistoric planet pterosaurs and makes them the best they have ever looked. Perhaps even more than the dinosaurs since pterosaurs rarely get proper attention. An interesting aspect of pterosaur biology, which was briefly noted by David, and which has been known for a while but firmed up recently, is what the hell kind of eggs these things were laying. Turns out these critters laid soft-shelled eggs like crocodiles and turtles. We never see the Alcyone eggs in this episode, but they are referred to as soft-shelled. We do see pterosaur eggs in the freshwater episode, but I'll save that discussion for that episode. Unnamed Pterosaur Juveniles Design The freshwater's first segment is the juvenile Ashtarkid colony. There were plenty of Ashtarkids across Asia during the Cretaceous, but not many are known from just Mongolia. The largest is the Mongol giant, known from very fragmentary remains from southern Mongolia, which suggest it would have been as large as the largest known and named pterosaurs. It's possible these juveniles belong to this pterosaur, but could just as easily pass for a bunch for which there are even less remains of. Dr. Nash states that they intentionally did not identify these pterosaurs, but speculate that these animals were present, as they were present worldwide at this time. Behavior Virtually nothing is known of the roosting or resting habits of the pterosaurs, and especially the Ashtarkids, but the prehistoric planet team found it quite likely that they would have gathered in numbers in places that predators could not easily get to like the cliff faces in this episode. This is serendipitous as pterosaurs were originally reconstructed as poor flyers that could only get into the air from high places, namely cliffs. They were assumed to live on these cliffs so that they could easily drop to fly and catch their food. Once more pterosaurs were found, and in basically all biomes imaginable, and once more was understood of their biology, it was found that the majority of them were particularly good at flying and at walking on the ground. The baby was thrown out with the bathwater though, as now pterosaurs are rarely depicted living on cliff faces, and yet some must have done this over their long natural history not clinging to the sides like bats so they can fly, but on the ledges to stay away from predators as birds do today. I don't think there is much more to say about the behavior of these guys. Velociraptor Design This is easily and obviously the most accurate Velociraptor ever put to screen. 
There is a strong possibility that the dromaeosaur designs in prehistoric planets are extremely close to how the real animal actually looked, barring fat distribution and colors and patterns. The velociraptors are well endowed with lots of fat and muscles as well as the connective tissues around the arms and legs, like the propatagium. These velociraptors are clad in a coat of simple filamentous feathers and complete veined feathers. This is both an inference from its closest relatives that have been preserved with feather impressions in their skeletons as well as direct evidence of feathers in a specimen of Velociraptor itself. A forelimb bone of Velociraptor has been described with a series of little knobs sticking out the back. These knobs correspond to the exact size and placement of what are called quill knobs in living dinosaurs. Plenty of birds do not have quill knobs, but if those knobs are present, they mean that there definitely were feathers there. If velociraptors had these quill knobs, they would have had large complex feathers on their arms. And if they had these kinds of wings, it is also quite likely that they had feathers covering the rest of their bodies from head to toe. This is backed up by the organization of feathers in other dromaeosaur fossils that have them preserved. Each of them was covered from head to toe in feathers, just like birds. If we take a look at the faces of these velociraptors, we will see something quite unique. The prehistoric planet team gave the velociraptors leathery skin around the jaw edges with some keratinization here and there. They look quite keratinized to me, or at least keratinized skin, but Dr. Nash states they are meant to be leathery skin, so I will go with that. As per the most recent work on theropod lips and considering the presence of formina and surface textures of Velociraptor, it should have lips, just as any other non-avian theropod. Some researchers and artists have hypothesized that dromaeosaurs have had keratinized skin or pure keratin sheaths over their face almost like bird beaks, but not much evidence exists for this. Hardened skin that became like keratin or straight up keratinized over time may be possible, what with the presence of formina and the rough or etched textures of the lip edge in Velociraptor. But I think more might need to be done before something as clear as keratin sheaths can be quantified for these dinosaurs. Another interesting thing to note about the anatomy of these raptors is their sickle claws. They are absurdly long and curly, and this is exactly what they would have looked like. This assertion is based on how much the keratin sheath over the claw bone extends the length of the claw in modern birds, but also other reptiles. This is also backed up by dromaeosaur specimens that directly preserve some chemical components or imprints of the keratin sheaths showing that the condition of the keratin sheath in dromaeosaurs closely mirrored that seen in modern birds of prey. Now, there is another odd bit about the velociraptors in this episode. Technically, the genus Velociraptor did not live with Tarbosaurus. Tarbosaurus fossils come from the Nemect formation, approximately 70 million years ago. Velociraptor comes from the Dejokta formation and Bayan Mandahu formation, both being about 75 to 71 million years ago. The thing is, though, that fossils of Velociraptorine dromaeosaurs have been found in the rock layers that also preserved Tarbosaurus fossils. They are just too fragmentary to name. The traits that are preserved in these specimens are so close to Velociraptor proper that further studies may even find them to be additional species of Velociraptor itself. So, for the sake of simplicity and popularity, the people behind Prehistoric Planet decided to use the name Velociraptor within the episode proper. Behavior the Velociraptors are shown individually hunting down lizards in the shadows of the snoozing Tarbosaurs. They are not portrayed as pack hunters, but as more opportunistic, perhaps partially social animals. They are seen moving in twos or threes on occasion. Support for this inclusion, as Dr. Nash has noted, comes from dromaeosaur trackways and the behavior of modern predatory birds. The only cooperative modern bird of prey is the Harris's hawk. They are known to hunt in groups of two to six. This makes pack hunting quite rare among birds, and perhaps it was rare in theropod dinosaurs as well. 
the second main characters, and the conflict of the pterosaurs segment of the Freshwater episode are the Velociraptors. These raptors use their wing-like forelimbs, broad tails, and feathered coats to boost their jumps, soften their landings, change direction, protection from surfaces, and control descent as they traverse the cliffside. The Velociraptors fall quite a ways in their pursuit of the pterosaurs, but their hollow bones, veined arm and tail feathers, and the overall coat of feathers act to protect the animal as it falls. This is something seen in most predatory birds today who have been known to attack and kill large mountainous mammals. This group of raptors is also shown hunting in packs. However, this pack is not coordinated like wolves, but socially opportunistic, similar to many reptiles and birds today. They don't help each other, but they are technically hunting together. Tyrannosaurus Design Tyrannosaurus has undergone the least most changes over the last few decades. By that, I mean the bones and their reconstruction have not changed much, but the outside details of the animal have quite a bit, but only in smaller details that someone unfamiliar with the literature may not even notice. Here, all of those details are laid bare for all to notice, or not, hence my confusion as to why it was never touched on, especially considering how famous the animal is. The most famous incarnation of the Tyrannosaurus is everyone's favorite Rexy of Jurassic Park. This is how most paleontologists and paleoartists of the 1980s through to the early 2000s reconstructed Tyrannosaurus. The T-Rex that appears here in prehistoric planet has more muscle, fat, and tissues. This is based on about 20 years of research on the bones of Tyrannosaurus and comparisons and inferences made using modern animals and increasingly well-preserved specimens of close T-Rex relatives. So, specifically, we see that the torso of this Tyrannosaurus is much deeper and wider than the Jurassic Park animal. All non-avian dinosaurs, like their crocodilian cousins, had a set of ribs which rested within their belly. They are commonly called belly ribs, or anatomically referred to as gastralia. These helped protect the belly and played a part in breathing. As more Tyrannosaurus specimens have been found, from the 90s to now, it has been found that Tyrannosaurus had an extremely deep chest, trunk, and pelvis. A full set of gastralia would have started here at the extremely deep and wide pubic boot and would have continued here until the shoulder girdle here. On top of this, Tyrannosaurus easily had one of the widest, most barrel-shaped torsos of any terrestrial predator to ever live. I mean, look at this chunker. They are literally big boned. On top of being big boned, they had the bony scaffolding that strongly suggests, and correlates to, enormous leg muscles. This part of the pelvis, the ilium, was huge and scooped. Here would have been where those enormous thigh muscles attached and pushed and pulled along the bulging calf muscles. The face of this Tyrannosaurus is probably the most obviously updated of the whole thing. You have keratinous hornlets on this part of the eye socket and this part. They sort of grow into one another to form a more prominent brow ridge. Not quite as copyrightably exaggerated as the Jurassic Park design, but still quite prominent. I would not be surprised if the real animal may have had even larger or pointier crests here. Another chunk of keratin is here on the ridge along the snout. I find it kind of a weird design choice to keep them conservatively colored. It has been a somewhat speculative hypothesis over the years that the keratinous nose ridge and hornlets of not just Tyrannosaurus or the other Tyrannosauroids, but of most theropods, may have been brightly colored in a similar way to the keratin which adorns the faces of many species of birds today. In this way, they may have had many visual functions, individual identification, species recognition, mate selection, and more. Some research, some of which included Dr. Darren Nash, found that sexual selection was the most parsimonious explanation and primary driving force behind the exaggerated facial crests of these animals, as well as the crests and horns of other dinosaurs like the Ceratopsians, Ornithopods, Thyreophorans, and more. A more recent study by soon-to-be Dr. Sarah Davis and Dr. Julia Clark found that a more likely part of the body to be brightly colored may have been the face and feet. 
They studied the presence of carotenoids in the skin of a bunch of living and extinct reptiles, birds, dinos, turtles, crocs, and more. Carotenoids are the pigments responsible for expression of bright yellows, reds, and oranges. Heavily simplifying, they concluded that there is about a 50% chance that carotenoid expression in skin and non-feather keratin was present in the most recent common ancestor of the archosaurs, the group including dinosaurs, birds, pterosaurs, crocs, and more. Feathers would not have been the best bet for bright colors. Instead, the skin on the legs and feet, the chest and neck, and the face are better supported by the data. Though it was also found that the theropod dinosaurs that deviated from a strict carnivorous diet may have had a higher probability for these brightly colored feet, necks, and faces. As such, the lack of color on the face or crests of prehistoric planets Tyrannosaurus falls under a sort of gray wiggle room. I personally would have liked to see these areas more colorful, but it is not inaccurate to keep them conservatively gray. Aside from the crests, you see the critter has a set of lips. This has been a semi-contentious issue in the last few years. The only reason for this is due to a few experts concluding a lower probability of the presence of lip-like tissues on the face. The vast majority of the scientific community agrees that lip-like tissues are more likely because nearly every single terrestrial animal has some sort of covering on their face to conceal their teeth. The major exceptions are those that evolved ways around teeth. If you have a beak, you probably don't have teeth too. The biggest stick in the craw of the lip v no lip discussion is that the only living cousins and descendants of the non-avian dinosaurs evolved away from the condition of most non-avian dinosaurs to such a degree that they no longer offer a good comparison or control group. All birds have no teeth, a beak, and no lips. All crocodilians have no lips. We can throw birds out of the discussion altogether because of the beaks. Crocs should also be thrown out due to how distantly related they are to the dinosaurs and for their highly derived body plan and habit. In fact, the only known group of dinosaurs to be anything like crocs were the spinosaurs, and even here they only share the most superficial of characteristics. A handful of researchers have directly compared the holes which poke through the face bones of most non-avian theropod dinosaurs to those of the crocodilians. They do share some similarities, but I'm not sure the comparison is that apt considering how distant crocs and theropods are phylogenetically and how different their ecology was. Instead, many researchers favor the dino face holes as passageways through which blood vessels were routed to provide sensitivity to the snout and blood to lip-like tissues. Many have balked at the inclusion of lips on theropod dinosaur reconstructions as they conflate these lip-like tissues with the lips of lizards or mammals. However, though they may have shared some mechanical similarities, the lips of the theropod dinosaurs would not have been the exact same type of structure. They were not like mammal lips and would not have allowed the theropod to snarl. They were probably more like the lips of lizards being immobile and simply to seal moisture within the mouth. Even here, I would caution away from direct comparison to lizards as the lips of theropod dinosaurs could not have been the exact same type of tissue either. Prehistoric planet's Tyrannosaurus walks the line quite nicely. They even gave it vertically aligned rows of feature scales along the snout, mirroring the holes within the bones. Tyrannosaurus eyeballs would have looked quite small compared to the vast heft of the animal. Despite these proportions, the eyeball was absolutely massive in gross overall size. They were about 8 centimeters in diameter, about 4 inches. That's roughly orange size depending on what kind of orange you are familiar with. This is bigger than most terrestrial animals alive today and would have gifted the animal with incredible sight. Here, the prehistoric planet people have given the animal rounded bird-like pupils. Unsurprisingly, the pupil shape of the extinct dinosaurs is pretty much a complete unknown. There is a clear relationship between ecological niche and the shape of the pupil in most animals alive today which would certainly have been true for the animals of the past. Herbivorous animals are more likely to have horizontal pupils than are predatory animals. Diurnal animals are more likely to have circular pupils than vice versa, and so on. 
This may be why, here, that the prehistoric planet team gave the Tyrannosaurus rounded bird-like pupils, inferring that they think it may have been a diurnal predator. Though there may be some evidence of its day versus night habits within its brain case, I don't think a study of this kind has yet to be conducted. Interestingly enough, Jurassic Park did the same with their Tyrannosaurus. In some shots, you can see a thin covering of hair-like feathers on the back of the head, neck, and some of the rest of the top of the body. Whether or not Tyrannosaurus had feathers has been another oft-discussed idea. Biggest problem is the lack of direct evidence. No Tyrannosaurus specimen has ever been found with skin or feather impressions. Uh, the exception to this was a tiny patch of scale impressions on one specimen. There are rumors that more impressions were preserved in this specimen but are yet to be described, and other rumors suggest bigger sections of skin may have been found on other specimens, but they remain rumors. The tiny chunk of skin that has been found reflects only scales, but the way it was preserved would not have preserved feathers if they were present. It also comes from a part of the body that probably wouldn't have been feathered if the animal even had feathers. Well, that's just great. Phylogenetically, or who and what it is related to, suggests that Tyrannosaurus would have been a good candidate among dinosaurs for a coat of feathers. It was a Tyrannoraptoran, cousin to the Maniraptor group. Maniraptorans include the vast majority of direct fossil evidence of feathers. Dromaeosaurs, birds, alvarosaurs, therizinosaurs, scansoriopterygids, troodontids, and oviraptorosaurs. That pretty much means feathers were ancestral to the Tyrannoraptora group. On top of that, a large Tyrannosauroid, Eutyrannus, had feather impressions preserved with the skeleton. This opens up an evolutionary reason to suspect Tyrannosaurus may have had feathers. Then comes the thermal properties. Feathers can function to keep an animal warm, similar to but not exactly like the hair or fur of mammals. Unlike mammals, feathers can also function to cool down an animal or to just keep a constant body temperature regardless of the environment. Birds of the tropics and deserts have feathers. Uh, then again, these are small animals and many theropod dinosaurs were as large as or bigger than the largest modern mammals. Some researchers suggest there is a size threshold where feathers become detrimental to the organism. Other researchers suggest this may not work with organisms as distinct as the non-avian theropod dinosaurs. Here, the prehistoric planet crew give the adult Tyrannosaurus only a sparse elephant-like covering. This episode also introduces us to a set of Tyrannosaurus younglings. Unlike the adult, these guys have a much heavier coat of fluffier feathers. This has been hypothesized for quite some time that it was the young of large feather-possible non-avian theropod dinosaurs that carried a coat of feathers. Besides that, the design of the T-Rex younglings match what is known of Tyrannosaurus and Tyrannosaur young to a T. They were more lightly built with longer legs, less muscle and fat, and longer, skinnier snoots. The main character here is the old male Tyrannosaurus, who is stated to be about 30 years old with the battle scars to prove it. He is recently scarred up from his battle with the Triceratops we see him eating in the beginning of his segment. Even though I am sure a lot of us would have wanted to see the battle that led to this scene, the point of this extra Tyrannosaurus segment is to show the more sensual activities they may have been up to. The old male makes his way to a river edge for a bath. We see him scoop drinking, or gravity-assisted drinking, which is common among many birds and reptiles today, and that was shown with Tarbosaurus in the last episode. He is confronted by a smaller, young female. The male rocks back on his tail and haunches and rears up to reveal his orange-colored throat before warbling and reverberating a semi-infrasound call to the female. She reciprocates, and the two acknowledge their bond by nuzzling, with Attenborough noting that Tyrannosaurs had super-sensitive snoots. Evidence from Tyrannosaur facial bones shows that they had high nervous sensitivity across the jaws and face, and that ritualized facial contact involving rubbing, nuzzling, and biting was something they probably did. A courtship pair highly likely engaged in facial contact, as shown. How did the prehistoric planet team determine the courtship postures and vocalizations that might exist in T-Rex? 
They looked at postures and calls made by living archosaurs that bracket T-Rex and found commonalities. Appeasement slash conciliation in living archosaurs involves head lifting, throat display, and while aggressive broadcast bellows can be issued with an open mouth, contact calls and advertisement calls are often closed mouth sounds that emanate widely from chests and necks. After the courtship displays, we cut to them in the process of mating, tastefully, prudishly, and strategically obscured by some foliage in the foreground. Everything about the mating sequence was informed by phylogenetic bracketing. Believe it or not, lots of work has been done on the mating postures and habits of non-bird dinosaurs, much of it informed by work on birds and crocs. This explains why the mating Tyrannosauruses are low to the ground, as opposed to the famous Spanish display of two Tyrannosaurus skeletons getting it on, with the male standing way too erect, which was probably not physically possible. Dinochirus Design Dinochirus is easily one of the single weirdest theropod dinosaurs ever found, aside from Spinosaurus. Only its arms were first discovered in the 1970s, and they were huge arms ending in enormous recurved claws. They were initially thought to belong to a giant predatory theropod, but were quickly re-identified as those that belonged to the ostrich dinosaurs, the ornithomimosaurs. It wasn't until the 2010s that more specimens of the animal were found. There are now two skeletons known that showed the animal to be a huge and bizarre member of the ostrich dinosaur family, with a humpback, long muscular tail ending in a set of fused vertebrae, and a duck-billed skull shaped like a cross between an Edmontosaurus and a spoonbill. The prehistoric planet Dinochirus is carrying a shaggy coat of dark brown to gray, soft, non-veined, filamentous feathers and a blue face. The extent to which huge dinosaurs, and in this case huge ostrich dinosaurs, were covered in feathers has been a hot button issue in recent decades. Some smaller ornithomimosaurs have been preserved with direct evidence of feathers in the form of impressions for huge, non-wing-like wings on ornithomimus, but not much is known about the coverings of larger forms. According to Dr. Nash, when the team started building the Dinochirus model, their understanding of its environment indicated cool or even cold environments. Plus, there are some reasons for thinking that dinosaurs were better at temperature control than big mammals. All of that is still open to new data showing otherwise, of course, but it was prudent to cover it in feathers. Some other artists have opted for bare skin and scales, and that may not be entirely wrong or out of the question either. Behavior Not much can be said of the behavior for this guy because he just eats, poops, and scratches on a dead tree. All things that all animals do at some point, though it is of note that his scratching is an obvious nod to bears doing the same thing. A shot of him lifting out of the water is a clear practical puppet, and there seems to be a hand puppet of sorts when he rakes up some water weeds. They also made fake dino poop out of various ground materials. Quetzalcoatlus Design The Quetzalcoatlus segment takes place in a flooded wetland in southern Africa. That seems strange. Quetzalcoatlus is a strictly North American animal. Well, the prehistoric planet team wanted to illustrate yet another intriguing hypothesis, that the biggest soaring pterosaurs were continent hoppers that migrated great distances for whatever reasons. Plenty of even small-sized birds can do this today, so why not airplane-sized pterosaurs that could ride drafts for hundreds of miles? As the female Quetzalcoatlus lands, she halts flight with two to three powerful downbeats before dropping to the ground, before folding her wings and adopting a tall, narrow, quadrupedal posture. The specifics of this ability were put forth by doctors Mark Witten and Darren Nash in a 2008 paper, so of course they were going to show it here. The design of the animal itself is spot on. 
The super tightly folded wings are present here, as in all other pterosaurs in this series, which I admit, we'll still need some getting used to. The animal is covered from head to toe in a coat of brownish gray feathers, which used to be called pycnofibers, but which turned out to be true feathers. The head does have the signature crest, but since this is a female, we don't get to see any showy colors on it. I love the warbly texture on the beak to represent the keratinous covering it had. She is also decked out in some good muscles and fat, though these animals did not seem to have the type of skeletal build for extra large muscles nor fat stores. They had to fly after all. Behavior The female's nesting behavior is really the main reason for this segment. A little is known about pterosaur eggs and nesting, but not much. Their eggs were soft-shelled and hence buried in damp substrates like soil, sand, or vegetation, and those of ashdarkids would have been big. The prehistoric planet consultants estimate about 1 kilograms each. It's known from fossils that pterosaurs could produce two eggs at once, one from each ovary. Clutch size might have been tiny, too, or large, up to 12. Prehistoric planet opted for larger since the total clutch mass of this size appeared right for an animal this large. Quetzalcoatlus was around 220 kilograms. The enemy female coming in to destroy the nest and eggs is common among many groups of animals alive today, so that's a perfectly fine addition. Though to watch the female go through all that work only for it to be destroyed was definitely soul crushing. Mashikasaurus Design Another member of the strangest dinosaurs list is Mashikasaurus. The body of the animal was not particularly weird, though its arms are a little strange, but its head is where the weirdness is at. Conventional reconstructions of the skull, which is fragmentary, have it with outward bending jaws and teeth that follow that shape, resulting in a zipper or flytrap like mouth of forward projecting teeth. When the jaws were recombobulated a little, what with new information from newly found relatives and with proper coverage of extra oral soft tissues, the face of Mashikasaurus becomes far less bizarre on the outside. This is what prehistoric planet opted for. The hands are tiny, which is what I mean by them being weird. The mother is decked out in reds and tans while the babies are green. The babies may have needed a little more adjustment of the adult model because they look just a bit too much like the adult model recolored green, but it's not enough to take me entirely out of the documentary. Behavior the diet and use of the jaws of Mashikasaurus has been one of the bigger parts of the discussions surrounding the animal. It used to be thought this snap trap would have been good for catching fish, but the teeth aren't really suited to that. Some have hypothesized that they used them for snagging onto hard-to-hold prey, like burrowing animals, snakes, and amphibians. Prehistoric Planet opted to show Mashikasaurus as an opportunist that uses its teeth to snap up crabs and crack through their hard exoskeletons. Beelzebufo Design Beelzebufo was a close relative to the living Ceratophryidae group known more commonly as the Horned Frogs. It was a big frog, but nowhere near as large as was originally thought. When first described, the frog was thought to reach up to 16 inches, which would put it in the running for the largest frogs to ever live. But later studies downsized it to a little over half that, at 9 inches, which puts it in the same size range as the African bullfrog. Ironically, it probably had similar bodily proportions to that old bullfrog. Since no soft tissues are preserved for this critter and since none have been preserved for its fossil relatives, plenty have opted to reconstruct it more like the horned frogs of today. The prehistoric planet Beelzebufo seems to combine traits from horned frogs and bullfrogs for a unique flat-headed frog with greens, yellows, oranges, and tans. It snaps up a baby Mashikasaurus with its huge, mucus-covered, forward-springing tongue in a really cool slow-mo shot. Elasmosaurs Design 
The Elasmosaurs close out the episode. However, they are left as generic, unnamed Elasmosaurs. This is because this whole segment is hypothetical, but based on direct fossil evidence of plesiosaurs found in freshwater and brackish water sediment deposits. They kept them unnamed because there are technically no freshwater or brackish water living or visiting elasmosaurs known from South America, where this segment takes place. But since fossils that prove these types of animals were in biomes like this are found in some places, it is logical to assume they were capable of moving into these environments in other parts of the world. As far as elasmosaurs go, these guys are pretty good. They are just modified Tyriangisaurus models with a light blue base color and some stripes. They breach from the water to catch some fish in a real neat shot. The science used for this show is groundbreaking. The speculative nature of a lot of the stuff shown is equal parts necessary and representative of the real world. Two of the main consultants, Drs. Mark Witten and Darren Nash, helped to bring forth the modern dinosaur renaissance with their little paperback landmark book, All Yesterdays. I've made a two-part series of their work here on Edge that you can view to get a really good idea of the kinds of visions that team was trying to convey. With their work, they were not trying to say that speculation should be taken as gospel or that those who cautioned conservativeness in reconstructing long-dead animals are wrong. Instead, their intention was to show the world that the animals of the past are as the animals of today, gross, complex, and alive. The world around us has only been around us for one to two million years. Before us, the modern paradigm has been around for 66 million years. Before that, there was an unfathomable expanse of time, 184 million years of time. If I wanted to really scramble your brain, there is an even more unfathomable expanse of time before that. But we're talking dinosaurs right now. For as alien as certain parts of the Mesozoic era may seem, the laws of nature retained their stranglehold. Animals of the Mesozoic had a much longer period of time to get gross and complex, so to think so narrowly as to only reconstruct the animals of the past as closely as their bones can say is to completely ignore everything we know about life. In fact, because of the much longer period of time that the dinosaurs had, it is nearly mathematically impossible to think they didn't get into weirder stuff than we see today. This seems to have been the driving force behind Prehistoric Planet, at least with the consultants and animators. I mean, we all know Favreau just wanted them to act like animals and look pretty. No shame or shade there. So what did you think of Prehistoric Planet? This video is way too hefty to only now get into the music, cinematography, and directing, or my criticisms therein. I have just gone through every single aspect regarding the science behind this show based on the very sparse information we have right now. Darren's tweets and the uncovered segments can only tell us so much. I think I can speak for everyone that we are eagerly awaiting a behind-the-scenes documentary on the documentary. In the meantime, we can only imagine. I do apologize for not getting to the rest of the series until the near premiere of Season 2. But it is what it is. At least it might get you to relook at Season 1 before we get more goodies. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.